their economy meant they raised no taxes at all. And now they're back into surplus. Now we think that right around them, because of this reduction in the call on the private sector to fund the public deficits, interest rates now are likely to be lower than what we ought to expect. Why is that important? Because the monetary authorities are also going to keep rates low. And so if you think out here that term deposits really aren't that, aren't that attractive. Here's the United States. Cash management account over there for more than $50,000, you get 0.6%. Five year term deposit, they call them certificate of deposit over there, 1.4. Put your money away for 10 years, you get 2.7%. Now, that is flowing through to here because though the investors over there are saying, well, where can we do better than this? Imagine if you're over there trying to run your pension fund, trying to generate enough cash to live on, either for yourself or for your investors. You're sort of thinking, well, where can I do better than that? Well, actually, Australia looks pretty good. So they're coming out here and buying our assets. Some of you would have had the Commonwealth Property Office Fund, got bought out by a consortium of Dexas and a Canadian teacher's pension fund. So they didn't want those businesses, they wanted the rents. So half of those, essentially half of those businesses now owned in Canada, we won't see them again. But they were sort of saying, well, if we've got to pay the teachers' pensions, we're going to need better than 2 or 3%. We want 5 or 6 or 7 Hey, there it is in Australia. I have, I have a real concern that you know, many of you will have listed infrastructure in your portfolios, like Sydney Airports, APA, Transurban. I think there's a real fear that over the next four or five years they will all disappear from Australia. Because the overseas investors will say, we like those. So that's what we've got to understand, is how do we continue to have assets in portfolios which can generate good cash flow. The big issue for Australian growth are these two big trends. Now I've got the urban population across the world, now it exceeds the rural population. So these are the latest United Nations estimates. <coughs> Why is that important? Well, people, when they go from living on the farm, are fairly self-contained in most subsistence economies. So they would have moved out, you know, people, you know, as an example, could have moved out of the, the rural shack up near the Great Wall of China and are now living in Beijing or Shanghai. While they're living in the shack, they probably had one electric light bulb, probably no running water, no flush toilet. Heating mainly come from the, the stove they used to sleep on or the, the cow or the pig that lived with them. So if they wanted food, they went out and grew it themselves. If they wanted water, they went and got a bucket. Didn't have a flush toilet. They move into now an apartment in China, in sort of Shanghai or Beijing or New Delhi or whatever. If they want to eat, they're probably going to go down the shop to buy something. They're going to have electric light. So those create a whole set of new demands. But the other big one that's also creating demands is the ageing of the population. So in another couple of years, for the first time in the world, such as this was also the first time in the world, we're going to have a billion people who will be over 60. And then within 30 years, we'll have another billion. So we'll have two billion. So we've got a world which is changing rapidly. It's now urban, it's middle class, and it's old. And those demands are quite different from a population which, which was largely rural, which was not that long ago. You know, you look back in the 1970s, we probably had double the population in the rural sector we did in cities. These people now want to eat the stuff we do and they largely want to buy it from us. And they travel. And that's the big change with an urban and older population and richer population. So now the Chinese, the expectation is this year there'll be 100 million Chinese will go outside China. Double what it was three or four years ago. And they're coming here. They love coming to Australia. They think we're safe and we're clean. And they spend more when they get here than anyone else big changes that have gone. <coughs> and so this is just a bit of a story about people concerned about the China story. And, and the thing I really point to here is the share of employment in agriculture. In China at the moment, it's about 30% of the population is employed in agriculture. Even though they're now becoming the world's biggest manufacturing country, they still are the world's biggest employer in agriculture. Probably still bigger than India. Now, these are government projections. They expect, and when you're in China, the Chinese government expects, you imagine it's actually going to happen. They expect the population in rural to fall from 30% to 12.5 by 2030. Put that in context, we're at three as Australia. So that's going to fall like that. Now, that is also going to grow their consumption. So retail spending in China currently, probably sort of a bit in the middle here, about 3,000. 
$500 billion. In context, about twice the size of the Australian economy. They're currently spending. By 2025, that's expected to have grown about 270%. But note here, so this will make it probably one of the world's biggest consuming economies, but their consumption per head is about $9,200 by then. That will be, uh, you know, at, at, you'd say by then, US consumption per head will be about $50,000. So it'll be the world's biggest consuming economy and still relatively poor. Why is this important? Well, we've got all these China risks you would have seen on the BBC and the ABC programs that China is about to come to an end and that's going to cause Australia to collapse. And we're still saying, no, we don't think so, for a number of reasons. First off, this debt is really all owed to each other. It's not owed to people outside. So the Chinese government can control it. They have very regionalised, what they call state-owned enterprises, not nationalism in the US. When Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the big mortgage businesses, went broke, they were national. Very high foreign currency reserves. They have plenty of money to spend from the rest of the world if they need it. And they're still building. So people go on about, you know, there's all these empty cities in China. Now they reckon in China there's 245 million homes and about 15 million of them are vacant. So the vacancy rate, while it looks huge in absolute terms, in percentage terms, are relatively low. The other thing too is a lot of them are being bought for investment purposes. And in China, people don't like buying second-hand things. And if a house has been lived in, it's second hand. So the Chinese investors over there, they buy a property and they'll leave it vacant because they're going to have more chance of selling it because it's still new. And the mortgage is still paid off inside four or five years. So you sort of think, yep, there is some overbuilding. But as I said with those rural statistics before, the Chinese government is aiming for another 300 million people to move from the rural sector to the city sector in the next 10 to 15 years. Okay? So you think these homes will be filled up. Now put that again in context, 300 million is about half of their total urban population now. So they're going to build 50% again of what they currently build. And then there's the road and rail system. Yeah, there's been a whole lot of waste going on there, but their argument is that their rail system is still only about a quarter the size of that in the United States. And they've got four times the population. There's plenty of space yet. Wages costs are showing strong growth, but you know, that's needed as their economy adjusts. Major commodity prices around the world, in the background, everyone goes, I mean, commodity prices are plummeting. Well, yes, they have, but they're still at very good level. So here's the red, it's the price of iron ore. Yes, it's come off from the GFC or the post-GFC peaks. It's now down about $100 a tonne. And I'm really crying for BHP and Rio and Vale because five or 10 years ago, they were getting $20 a tonne. <laughs> so, yeah, that's stiff. Now, it's not going to go much lower than that, in my view, because the $100 a tonne is about the cash cost of Chinese iron ore production, and China is the world's biggest producer of iron ore. But they effectively produce dirt with a bit of iron in it. Their iron ore content's about 40% compared to BHP and Rio being up there 60 to 70%. So they need to dig out a lot more dirt than we do. But also copper. Copper prices, which we think is a really good indicator of how the world is going because you use copper in just so many things, including the electricity industry. That's now back around $7,000 a tonne. Peaked at about nine to 10, and again, $2,000 a tonne. And you sort of think, these guys shouldn't be screaming too loud. The interesting thing is with this high levels, Businesses like BHP and Rio, their cost of production is about $40 a tonne. So they have massive opportunities for cash flow. And the strange thing is, you know, four or five years ago, you wouldn't have bought a miner for the cash flow because you never expected to get paid in dividends. You bought your term deposits. You bought your banking shares. We may well be in a situation where we're looking at the miners, including Woodside Petroleum and even Santos, to actually be significant sources of cash flow for your portfolios in years to come because they're going to be generating so much cash from these huge projects. So it's just going to be a bit of a flip around in what we might look at. Uh, commodity prices overall remain quite high. Everyone goes on about commodity prices falling, including Mr. Weather or Mr. Coots and Titus here. But in fact, here's the price of metal, so actual copper metal, steel, platinum and gold, and all the other things. Then you sort of see the metals are actually above the GFC prices. Price of oil, sitting up there at $105, $106 a barrel. And food prices, this is really what 
is being driven by the middle classes wanting to eat better and eat more and actually eat more protein. So those food prices are now really at record levels. That's really good for Australia, particularly South Australia. They want to buy a wheat not because they're going to make more noodles or buns or bread, but because they want to feed the cows and the chooks and the pigs. They want more dairy food. New Zealand budget will be in surplus next year. And they are benefiting because of the huge rise in dairy prices. They keep on referring to their skim milk powder as being their iron ore. They've had the same rise in commodity prices on average as us, just in a different, quite a different area.